on United States campuses. I know it's not easy thing, and we are very proud of you. When I say we are, it's the common people. <coughs> okay, we, we are, it's the common people. That's led me to the second thing, before I will introduce myself, but all of, all of the lecture is going to be about introducing myself. That's led me to the second thing. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a, pre I'm not a representative of anything. I'm not an ambassador. I don't want to be an ambassador, okay? Uh, I don't come to share with you views of any official body in Israel. And now I will introduce myself and you will understand what is my position as well. My name is Dr. Ido Zelkovich. You can call me Ido. Only my wife and my mom call me Dr. Ido. Mm -hmm. And that's enough for me. Uh, I was uh, a visiting professor over here in the great University of Minnesota. I enjoyed my stay over here. It was a great time. I'm now head of a new department of Middle Eastern Studies in the Academic College of Emek Israel in uh, Israel. I'm a research fellow in the University of Haifa, the Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies. And I'm also teaching in the IDC Erzelia. So I'm doing a lot of job, a lot of work, sorry. Besides it, I'm also a policy fellow uh, in the Israeli think tank that's called Mitvim. It's a newly and very important think tank in Israel that work for the fresh start for Israel among nations. A little bit uh, to the progressive side in Israeli terms, not in American terms. And this is all the thing that I'm basically doing in uh, Israel when I'm not sleeping, eating, or watching football. I mean, the real thing, soccer. Yes, not <laughs> okay. um, before we go into the business, like I said, I will not represent any formal view. As academic, I want to give you an analyzing of the current reality. Not just I see it, but as I understand it according to different sources that I'm using. All of my talk will be focused only about my academic analyzing of reality. Later on in the Q&A, we can open the floor for comments and also for personal views. By the way, I have my own personal views, but I'm trying to keep them for myself. Okay? Because as academic, and I see it in the United States, a lot of people doing this mistake in purpose. In the United States, for example, some of the people are coming to, not to teach, but to preach in class and after hour. When I'm going to speak in my own voice, I will tell you this is my opinion. And I have an opinion. I'm Israeli. I'm Israeli. That's how I grew up. Thank God. I'm a Zionist. <coughs> I don't want to get into this discussion. Right, left, north, south, okay? This is my position. This is the, the place that I see the world from. Later on, we will also give our personal voices a uh, place in the class, but that will be only on the, in the Q&A. Now, I want you to understand my analyzing. So before I say that I'm not representative of any narrative, I must say that if I want to be an ambassador, of, if I have to choose if to be an ambassador, I will be only ambassador of my hometown, of Haifa. I grew up in Haifa which is a beautiful city with a lot of potential. Reminds me sort of San Francisco. And also liberal in the sense of coexistence. Jews and Arabs, we grow together. I'm in the age of seven and eight. Used to play football, the real game, <coughs> with my Arab neighbors, Arab friends. We grow up together. No discrimination. Just one community. I speak Arabic because when I was a kid, we played together. Yes, sometimes having fun, sometimes fighting like kids do, 
in the same soccer field. This is the spirit of Haifa. There is coexistence in our city. It's very, I will not say it's a unique in Israeli terms, but it's, it's a beautiful place. So if you are coming to visit Israel, doesn't matter where to taglit on, on your own expenses, don't just be focused on Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Yes, Tel Aviv, it's fun. But Haifa is beautiful. So if I should be an ambassador, I'm only ambassador of uh, Haifa. I grew up in the city among Jewish and Arabs. In the age of 18, like every Israeli, I went to the army, served in the, in the, in the infantry, and spent some time, a lot of time, as a soldier in the West Bank and in other places. Now, this is not the main issue of the lecture, but I want you to understand from, from where I'm coming, okay? In order that I can be as objective as I can with you during my analyzing. Every researcher is coming with his own personal background. And, she, and he, she, he or him, or, you should not hide it. Okay? During my military experience, which is not <coughs> important, I was aware for a lot of things. And I spoke the languages, uh, the Arabic language. I was talking with people, I, I was exposed to reality, and I actually used to asking myself sort of question, why life is like that going, what, what I'm doing over here, why we should do this, why we should do that, Yes, sometimes reality in the field is not very easy and nice. And nice. Basically, as a 19-year-old boy, I would prefer to be in the football stadium instead of there. But I'm kidding. I was very proud to serve my country. But I used to ask all of these questions. And after I finished my military service in the age of 22, 21, 22, doesn't matter. I'm historian, I'm not coming from social science or numbers, you know, just serving us, we are not serving the numbers from a, method, from a methodological point of view. I wanted to understand the Middle East in a deeper sense. Therefore, I was signed into the class of Middle Eastern Studies in the University of Haifa. I finished my BA, my master, my PhD. My research is focused on Palestinian society and Arab-Israeli conflict and issues of identity building in the Middle East. After I finished my PhD, I went abroad. I did my postdoc in Germany. Why in Germany? You can ask my. You can ask me why. Why in Germany? The the answer is very simple. Because I'm a Jew. I wanted to experience it a bit of the other Germany. I was over there for one year, then I came to Israel and from Israel back to the state. I spent some time with you over there. It was good. I really enjoyed the university over here. And now I'm uh, very happy to be here back with <coughs> all of you. So thank you for inviting me. This is my background, okay? And after now, we all know one each other. Let's start business, okay? Are you all in? Yeah. I don't tell you, because yeah. I'm waiting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's start. So first thing that I want to talk about it, the Arab Spring. <coughs> I guess all of you heard this term. When you want to understand current reality in the Middle East, since the end of 2011, we are living in the age of turmoil. I'm basically don't like the use of this term, the Arab Spring. I don't think that in the Middle East, since 2011, we're seeing any Arab Spring. By the way, they took this term from the Western experience and tried to duplicate it and use it in order to understand processes of change in the Middle East. We don't see any Arab Spring, but we also not see any kind of Islamic winter and all of these terms. I don't like to use it. What we are seeing on the ground in reality, we are today in our region, in my region, not the Middle East, the Middle East, everyone in his own mid, yes? We are living in the age of Arab revolutions. We are seeing Arab revolutions. Every revolution got its own unique reason, 
And we are still living, I will say, in the age that we see these revolutions in process. The Arab Spring or the Arab Revolution are still continuing. Now, if you're looking into the Middle East, one should also remember, let's talk about the historical background, that until 1917, all of the Middle East, and so some places of Asia and Northern Africa, were basically one political unit and was managed under or controlled under the flag of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman ruler was also there. Here is coming. Let, 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 let's let the Ottoman Sultan pass with his uh, helicopter and continue. He was also the Khalifa. You, have you heard this term, Khalifa? Yes? The replacer of the prophet, Muhammad. Therefore, that's the first point that you should understand. Therefore, there was no separation between religion and the state. Not like in Europe, the United States, etc. And until today, if you will open every constitution of Arab country that's surrounding Israel, you will find the follow line. Al-Sharia, the Islamic law, Sharia, Islamic law, is the base for the state law. Okay? So what we are actually seeing, strong countries with institutes like Egypt, like Jordan, like Saudi Arabia, survived the term of revolution. More weakest countries, such as Syria and Libya, collapsed. Tunisia, Tunisia, which was the starting point of the Arab Spring, have survived. That's thanks to its democratic foundation. Now, when you see all of these turmoils around and trying to understand what's happening in Israel itself, <laughs> there is no doubt that Israel in our region, and that's why the American interest it's, is, is to invest in Israel. Israel is the only island in the Middle East of stability, democracy, and personal freedom. Those are the foundations that help Israel to be as strong as it is. Between 2000 and 11 to 2014, and now I will start to speak about the Arab, uh, sorry, not the Arab, <coughs> the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In this period between 2000 and 11, 2012, actually, to 2014, there was relatively, relatively quiet, relatively quiet in the Palestinian territories. And I'm asking myself why. This is the reason. Because of the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, decided to promote the Palestinian question while using political tools, by using diplomacy instead of other options. The efforts of Abu Mazen, I must say, got failed. And today, the Palestinian National Movement, movement founded itself in, the, in an historical junction, and they must take decision. Abu Mazen is the head of Fatah, which was established in 1959. Later on, Fatah took over the PLO that was established in 1964 as a reaction to the establishment of Fatah by the Arab League. Fatah was the first symbol of Palestinian national identity or an independent national identity after the war of 1948. Fatah was founded on the base of armed struggle ideology. Since the beginning of negotiation in the mid-90s, the official Fatah and the official PLO, in brackets, yes, adopted the UN Security Resolution 242, which 
basically called for the, rec the recognition of every people and state in our region. Therefore, who adopting, the <coughs> one who adopt, adopting the 242 resolution is actually saying in different words, I am for the two-state solution. The mid-ranks on lower structure of Fatah don't accept this former policy in its own. They gave the leadership the opportunity to lead them into, into somewhere. But the official PLO leadership failed to deliver the goods. Basically, on the paper, the PLO is still for the two-state solution, but only under its own terms. That's what happened in reality. Now, the alternative to the PLO in the Palestinian political field is Hamas. Hamas is a cronynum for the Islamic, Islamic resistance movement in Palestine. Harakat al Mukawama al Islamiya fi Palestine. Hamas comes with a clear vision of its own reality. And by the way, this is a vision that Fatah don't have today. Hamas is calling in its vision for the establishment of one state from the river to the sea, which be a Palestinian Islamic state that should be built upon the destruction of the Israeli entity, according to their own terminology. Is it clear? Fatah were still looking for the right formula how to establish a Palestinian state according to the agreements that have, that have been signed in the past. <coughs> now, this difference is creating a huge gap between of the divides. And Hamas in a sense Hamas, in a sense, is a more younger political movement, and maybe I would say more local and grassroots, especially when we are talking about the Gaza Strip. Because the PLO leadership operated during the 60s and 70s from abroad. And Hamas grew up in the end of the, in, in the, end of the 80s from the below. In 2014, after, the, after that the PLO leadership understood that they cannot deliver the good, the strategy has been changed a little bit. I want to now jump and talk about the summer war in Gaza of 2014. Now, if you remembering, if you remember, the war broke out after Hamas terror cell operated in the West Bank, kidnapped and killed, killed, murdered three Jewish youngsters. They were between 16 to 17. As a reaction, Israel started to arrest and destroy Hamas political, economical, social, and military infrastructure in the West Bank. The reaction of Hamas was from the Gaza Strip. Hamas launched missiles into Israel, targeting, targeting civilian infrastructures. Israel reacted, targeting back Hamas military bases and infrastructures. But the problem is that Hamas is a guerrilla uh, formula organization. It's a terror organization that's working in the form of guerrilla warfare. Therefore, it's launching its attack from a civilian population. Some of the civilian population is identifying with Hamas, support it. Some of it were working against their own uh, so against Hamas onwards. So that was the reason. I and, and by the way, I don't think I don't think that was a sort of miscalculation 
in the summer of 2014. Hamas wanted a war because of the political deadlock inside the Palestinian political system. Since 2006, since 2006, I know a lot of information today, a lot of information. Since of 2006, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank are running separately, separately under two different governments. And even if we have a unification government from 2014, it's only on the paper. Now, in 2006, you must remember that Hamas was elected democratically by the Palestinian people. And Fatah, in the end of the day, didn't accept the, the results. Not only Fatah, but also Israel and the United States of America. Now I want to surprise you. And I will say the following. If the Palestinian people choose, choose freely and democratically Hamas, we cannot decide for them who will be their own elected leadership. That's democracy. You cannot ask the Palestinians to be a democratic society and then say to them, well, we don't like the results. We will not, we will not respect the results. You saw the debate last year. You saw the debate yesterday, yes? There is no such a thing not to accept the results of a democratic <laughs> I was a kid back then. I was a kid back then. But that's that's the basic. That's that's the basic of democracy. Okay? And the vote said we give you opportunity to choose your leadership and now we don't accept it. Now Hamas is going today into a change. And when you are choking Hamas, and I really do believe that Hamas as a political entity should not be uh, any Israeli partner. There is nothing to negotiate with Hamas. Hamas is a terror organization. But when you're choking Hamas, they don't have any alternative but using their own arms. And by the way, I also want to say the following. No one can ask Hamas politically to disarm itself. Hamas without its weapons, Hamas without the jihad, Hamas without the struggle against Israel is not Hamas anymore. This is the main basic ideology of Hamas. This is what Hamas needs in order to gain the support among of its, of, of, of its people. So in 2014, Hamas was with its back to the corner. They were, were suffering from an uh, economical crisis. They didn't have any political horizon. And they wanted to change things by creating a situation of a war with Israel and through political violence to negotiate later on. Like say, you know, like you heard about the famous Russian general, General von Krasovich, good friend of mine. Yeah. He's a, he's a nice well, guy. The background of my phone. Yeah. yeah. What he said, what did he say about diplomacy in the world? What did he say about policy, about diplomacy in the world? Do you remember? He's a nice guy. His famous quote is like, uh, war is the, the means of politics, but policy by other means. That's all, my friend. Great. This is what Hamas wanted. By war, to create an environment of later on policy. And Abu Mazen didn't deliver any good for its people. And by the way, you are still young and beautiful. I'm just <coughs> young. I'm just young. But you are still just young and beautiful. People in the younger age are more radicalized, naturally, than in their own, than, than as they are in the end of the 30s. Like, I don't know, already the end of the 30s. Time flies. So, Hamas <coughs> want to mobilize through armed struggle the younger generation. And they are saying, Fatah tried with armed struggle, failed. Try with diplomatic efforts and fail. We are now offering you not just armed struggle, but under the banner of jihad with a religious meaning. Now, in the reconciliation process between Fatah and Hamas, we see, we saw in the past 
a lot of attempts, a lot of an attempts. The Egyptian tried to, medi to, to mediate between of the two and failed. Qatar tried to mediate between of the two and failed. Turkey tried its own channels and failed. The battle between Fatah and Hamas is a crucial one. It's not about, it's not just about of sharing political power and money. It's also about the future face of Palestinian society. While the PLO is, it's don't know where you want to go, two-state solution, what's going to be the state, what's going to be the nature, moderate less, moderate more. Hamas coming with a clear vision, like I said before, an Islamic Palestinian state, not just Islamic state, they are not ISIS, they are not ISIS, it's not just Islamic state according to the Sharia, but it's Islamic state with a Palestinian character. And in this sense, Hamas vision is more clear to the younger generation. After a lot of attempts, Hamas have, Hamas, I will surprise you, Hamas failed in its attempts to show some priority over the PLO. And today, actually, I want you, uh, today, actually, I brought you these two pictures that can tell you all of the story. Over here, you see one of the attempts to reconciliate between Fatah and Hamas. Only Abu Mazen, the Palestinian president, is on the stage. He's showing Hamas who is the boss. And by the way, Abu Mazen, who used to be described in the past as a very weak leader by the Israeli media, is by far no weak leader. Ariel Sharon, the late Israeli Prime Minister, used to describe Abu Mazen back then in 2006, seven, as a young, that's, that's Ariel Sharon quote, not my quote, as a young chicken without the feathers. And I'm telling you, Abu Mazen is not young chicken without feathers. He is the oldest and smartest fox in the forest. He was all of his life diplomat, sitting in junctions of political crisis. Got over them. It's hot, it's hot, it's not just me. It's, uh, it's not just me. It's their condition. Everything is cool? Okay. And Abu Mazen is still controlling his people with very strong handed. You can see that Hamas leader, Khaled Marshal, for all the ceremonies, seated in the first row in the crowd and never ever had a chance even to speak or to share one word with the press or with his colleagues. Colleagues. Now, I don't want to go over all of the articles of the agreements of reconciliation between Fatah and Hamas. You can read it right now on the board, and I'm telling you why I'm not following every single article. You can read it while I'm talking, because they don't want to fulfill it. Each movement wants to control its own territory, and there is no true Palestinian effort for reconciliation. So why there is no true Palestinian effort for reconciliation? Because Hamas set itself a goal. Hamas wants to take the PLO from the within. The PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, is actually the political entity, the political body that Israel is negotiating with. The Palestinian Authority, okay, was established as a result of the negotiation between Israel and the PLO. Abu Mazen have three titles. President of the Palestinian Authority, Chairman of the PLO, which is above, and also head of Fatah, which is the ruling party that controls the PLO from within, and the Palestinian Authority. Hamas wants to take the PLO from the within, and Abu Mazen knows it. Abu Mazen and Yasser Arafat did it in the end of the 60s, and since then, they are controlling this umbrella. 
Now, after 2012, Hamas tried to become more political and tried to, to, to protect itself as a more legitimate player. You can see over here Ismail Haniyeh running in the Arab domain, asking for the support of the people. In 2014, ladies and gentlemen, things got changed, and I will tell you why. After the war in the Gaza Strip in 2014, Hamas demanded for ceasefire the following articles. First and foremost, and I think this is the most important demand from Palestinian perspective, Hamas asked for the reopening of the Rafah border. And what does it mean? Ladies and gentlemen, Israel have withdrawn completely and totally from Palestinian soil in the Gaza Strip. There, this is a fact that no one can negotiate it. There is no even one footstep of Israeli soldier on the Gaza Strip. Yes, Israel sealed its border. This is Israel right. As long as Hamas controlled by, uh, sorry, as long as Hamas controlled the Gaza Strip, why Israel? should have open passage with terror organization. This is madness. Am I right? That's all. Second, Hamas claiming that the Gaza Strip is under siege. The Rafah border in the southern part of the Gaza Strip, it's a natural border between the Gaza Strip and Egypt an Arab sister country, the most important and influenced country in the Arab world. Who should take care of the Palestinians? Israel, which they call themselves, which, which have been called by the Palestinians. Not all of them, not all of them, but, all, but some of them call Israel its legendary enemy. As long there is no peace agreement between of the two. There is no civilian responsibility of Israel over the Gaza Strip. We have withdrawn from there. There is no occupation over the Gaza Strip. West Bank, another story. Gaza Strip, it's a fact. And look in the demand. Who can open the Rafah border? Israel? Is Israel sitting in Egypt? No. Second amendment, expansion of fishing zone of Gaza. Okay, take it, go fish. <laughs> International summit, okay, this is what diplomats do. Go to summits, conferences. Hamas also wants to go to cocktail parties, it's okay. <laughs> Everyone wants to go to cocktail parties. Passage from the Gaza to the West Bank, sea and airport for Gaza, by the way, the Israeli government, which is today the most rightist Israeli government ever, started to discuss about the issue of building a port, a port and airport in Gaza, which I don't personally think that should be uh, in the form, in, in the current like the current situation is right now. The issue of prisoners, which is a very important issue from Palestinian perspective. And also Hamas demanded that Israel be stopped to targeted terrorists. And of course, in the end of the day, it's politics. In politics, it's all about the money. They wanted the PA to pay their own salaries. The, the, but Hamas didn't, by the way, Hamas didn't achieve even one demand <coughs> of its goal of the 2014 uh, claims. What Hamas achieved, unfortunately, what Hamas did achieve, unfortunately, really, this is the achievement of Hamas. Hamas brought only destruction over the Palestinian people. And I want to tell you something. In the 2014 summer war, Israel came without clear strategy. 
is a leading to you from A to Z. When I say Israel, it's the government. Yes, I'm not a representative of the government, I should say. What they want? There was no clear strategy. And like said Admiral Nelson in the past, if you don't know where you want to go, no wind will take you there. Therefore, this clash became a war of more than 55 days. 55, I guess, I think, 55. And this is the only result that Hamas brought to its people, a destruction of the Gaza Strip infrastructures. Today, there are more than 50,000 inner refugees in the Gaza Strip <coughs> as a result of the war. More than 10,000 houses have been destroyed completely as a result of the war. Experts saying that it will take at least 15 to 20 years to rebuild the infrastructure and to rehabilitate the Gaza Strip. That's, ladies and gentlemen, that's a shame. That's really, that's human tragedy. That's a result of a war that could be prevented if both sides, both sides, would see it across the table and negotiate. But you cannot negotiate with Hamas. And therefore, if there, not, if there is not going to be a reconciliation between Fatah and Hamas, it will be very hard, very difficult for Israel to step forward and to run and manage a true, a true negotiation, a freaking one that can lead us into regional stability. That's the result of war, which I sadly say could be and can be and must be prevented. Now, where we are heading to. Sorry. You know what? I will leave this summary aside for a second. And I want to say you, I want to say to you the following. Well, Hamas knows that the war of 2014 was a total failure. <coughs> and if you want to understand the current intifada that we are seeing right now, the current intifada is a continuation of 2014 summer. Hamas don't want the Gaza Strip to be heated again. So today, they are using social media and another tools in order to try and create a sphere of violence and resistance against Israel. How they do so? First and foremost, what you like, what you love, what you live, social media. Hamas is very strong and dominated in the social networks. Hamas controlling news agencies, news agencies, news agencies. Can I be critic on your generation? I know I'm not so older, I'm not, I'm not your grandpa, yeah? yeah. <laughs> Can I be a little bit critical? Oh. Guys, guys, you see this stupid thing, the smartphone, this stupid thing? What was invented in Israel? Yeah, but yes, but I'm not doing Asbara. I'm not Asbara. <laughs> Uh, but some of it, some of it, yes, some of it, no, the Chinese are also good. And the Americans, come on, the Americans. <laughs> Am okay, I right? So, so American pride. So this stupid thing, the smartphone, I guess it's the common source for you to get your basic news. And between of us, me sometimes also doing this sport, we are reading the headline after headline after headline, not full articles, yes, and continue because this is the spirit of time, the auto strand of knowledge, yes, change the way that we are consuming all of our uh, news and knowledge. Are you with me? Now, Hamas using these news agencies to deliver a message. And a good message is a short and a clear one. And a good message is actually composed not from 
words only, but from clips and pictures and posters that shape your mind. Now, do you remember that I said that Israel had no strategy, clear strategy during the summer war of uh, 2014? Do you remember it? Of course you remember it. One of the myths that Hamas started to develop after the war, and by the way, it's a myth, a wrong one, but they must give their own people a pride, sense of hilarious victory. They claim that Israel is afraid to confront them on the ground. That Israel just got technology and missiles, but suffering from lack of spirit. And I'm telling you, our paratroops and our infantry are great. But that's not the problem, not as bad guys. Young people, and of course, soldiers, or everyone who is engaged in military activity, need meats in order to operate. And they are believing in it. Uh, how can you see it? How they're doing so by using social media. I want you now to show a short clip. Yeah, this is the time for the clip. That will help me to introduce you this social phenomenon. Let's look in the short clip and later on I will explain to what you are seeing. There is also English subtitles for the one of the who would not speak Arabic or Hebrew. Okay, yes? Thank you. It's a name who sings it well. The clip is in Hebrew. Thank my uh, research assistant over here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, the Palestinians. Yeah, I will explain what we're doing. That was the least I've seen much worse. I've seen like a Palestinian uh, Muslim group singing, uh, singing the girl rap song to call it kill the Jews. Yes, but uh, let's be more that optimistic. Let's be more optimistic. So, what you now just have saw, what, what have you seen right now? This clip was a song in which language? Hebrew. Which language? Hebrew. But it was, it was producing in order to target the Palestinian young generation. What actually you saw the new image of the Jew in the Palestinian eye. They want to protect the, they want to portray, to portray the Jews or the Israelis. You saw it was a Jew. It wasn't an Israeli or a Zionist. As a very weak persons that are afraid to confront with the Palestinians. This song, this clip was diffused among the uh, Palestinians with Arabic subtitles, and is actually calling the young generation of Palestinians to go out to the streets and try to kill every Jew as we see with, with what? With their bare hands, bare hands, knives, cars, whatever they can get. 
And this is the message of Hamas to the Palestinians in the West Bank. This is how they try to mobilize them. This is the spirit of time. Because Hamas knows that any round of violence can bring this total destruction to their own territory. And if they will try to create a violence sphere in Eastern Jerusalem or in the West Bank, they will not carry any sort of responsibility, not for the result and not from an international law perspective. Because the one who is in charge and supposed to run the show over there is, is Abu Mazen. Therefore, as long that we have this inner conflict between Fatah and Hamas, no one can ask from Israel to go further in the negotiation process. Because Hamas' main task is to make an Islamic state over the Israeli soil. And Hamas will not let any negotiation to continue and create another reality for the Palestinians. Reality of peace, of stability, and prosperity. All of those nice words are standing in contrast to the interest of Hamas. So with this saying, I will end right now, and I will open the floor for your own question. <coughs> yes, please. <coughs> name, your name? Um, Nice name, Aaron. But I guess you are not the brother of Moses. <laughs> <laughs> that was the 